Anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. And welcome back to the Knights of Venom. I'm your host, Frank. Today, I'm joined with my partner, Neil. He's back from his hiatus. And uh, uh, listen, Neil, sad story today. Um, conservative talk show icon Rush Limbaugh passed away today. I know he was very influential in my life, Neil. Um, I listened to him for almost two decades. Um, I have a lot of thoughts um, on Mr. Limbaugh and um, uh, mostly good. There are some critiques I have of him, but I think in general, what I like to say is I think he was, uh, whether we agree with him wholeheartedly, politically or not, I think he was a decent human being. And I think I want to extend my, you know, my best thoughts, wishes, prayers, and hopes to his family, Neil. Um, were you an avid uh, listener of Limbaugh or more casual? Um, in my younger years, I was mostly, uh, I was listening to him every day. Okay. Um so I'd say in my uh, my early twenties, and even as a teenager, I heard a lot of Rush Limbaugh. So I think I wouldn't be where I am today uh, if I if I haven't heard of him, uh, because I know my brother listens to him religiously. Um, my mom would turn him on whenever we were in the car, and that's how I heard of him. Uh, so I think even, you know I don't have to agree with everything he says. Uh, but I can still appreciate the influence he has had on the country, and really, talk sh uh, talk radio wouldn't exist. Um, I think in, if he didn't show up, because he kind of made it mainstream and made it popular, you know, um, at least among conservatives, um, and really influenced the conservative movement. Uh, he was, I guess, you could say, the de facto leader. You know, you could say the conservative. Wow side of things uh now as i got older I, I didn't listen to him as much uh and by older i mean 30s i guess um mostly because i i mostly listen to podcasts now mm -hmm. and his was radio i mean i know he does a podcast but i think you have to pay for it yeah uh, so i i didn't have it yeah, I, I think my story is very similar to yours. I started listening to him right around 1996, 97, when my intellectual curiosity for politics really peaked right in the midst of that Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton era mm -hmm. thing. It's when I started listening to him, and I, and I faithfully listened to Rush up until probably around 2012, I'd say, right when um, I had sort of an epiphany of sorts politically when the, the re-election of Barack Obama happened and I left uh, social media for a while and kind of went into my years of wilderness, I guess you could say, of study and me finding my Catholic faith and, and then finding integralism in that period. That's when I stopped listening to Rush. Now, I throw him on here and there in the car when I'm driving and listen to what he has to say here and there. Um, but I think between like 1996, 97, all the way to about 2012, he had a big influence on me and I learned a lot from him, especially from the conservative philosophy and ideology which i identified for so long and i think in many respects um he had a a definite grasp of not only the conservative ideology but he he found a way to do it in a very entertaining manner and i think that was one of the key su success he had oftentimes um, an idea or an opinion that went contrary to sort of um you know the status quo and, and he did it in a way where he could be entertaining in that respect. And so I think his legacy, ultimately, like you said, it, it will leave a lasting impression for many generations to come um, as he was really the king of right-wing talk radio. And I think he's a big loss, I guess, if you want to look at this, um, I guess, this battle, this dichotomy between the left and the right, he's a big loss. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a huge loss for uh those on the right um because he's 
he was one of the biggest voices uh, out there. Now, we do have other voices now. I mean, I remember back at the, when I was younger, he was really the only voice I heard. I mean, now you can hear Sean Hannity or uh, Glenn Beck or something. But yeah. at the time, he was the only one. And he wasn't afraid to say it how it was. You know, he would spit out, you know, in layman's terms, what's going on. And he would call the, the Democrats and the left uh, to task. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't let them get away with uh, a lot of their stuff, you know. Um, so I think it's going to be a, a a huge hit, especially if I mean I'm sure they got someone to replace him on on the radio, but if they don't, it would be it would really be a big hit for the, the conservatives because I mean he just has such a wide audience and a huge influence. Well, he's also one of a kind too. The way he does it too. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of talk radio hosts on the right out there and they're all pretty much the same shtick and uh mm-hmm. i think with limbaugh he was not the same shtick he was the original guy and everybody tried to mimic and copy him but i don't think they did it with nearly as much success i'll be honest with you, i listened to hannity for many years as well too right around that same time i stopped listening to limbaugh and i'll be honest hannity got old to me it's the same yeah, I, didn't, I never liked hannity really uh yeah. especially with his yeah, you know, I'm Catholic and I know what I'm talking about thing. It's like it, it just got on my nerves. I know. But even apart from that, he, he tends to be very repetitive mm-hmm. and um, I didn't find him nearly as entertaining as Rush. I, I, yeah. I, I just think Rush did it in a very entertaining manner. He had a talent as much as, you know, I, I disagree with some issues later on as I kind of began to see certain fallacies <clears throat> in the way the nation was being governed. And I guess that's my question here. You know, Neil, I, it's hard for me here in many respects because whenever I talked about Limba in the past on this podcast, we tended to lose subscribers because I've been critical <laughs> of some of the things, okay? Now, let me just say this. When I'm critical of Limbaugh, it's not because I'm a leftist or a progressive in any kind of way. If, you know, you guys that listen to this podcast on a regular basis know that. We despise what the left is. We despise the satanic Democratic Party, as I said so many times on this channel. But there are some real differences between conservatives and integralists in that matter. And I think there are some errors on that side of the aisle. Neil, I I don't know if it's appropriate to talk about some of those differences on today. Um, But I think, um, you know, and maybe we could do a future show on it. But just I just want to make it clear, even with all my criticisms of Limbaugh, I still respected the man. And in his own way, as imperfect as he was and and. And maybe we could talk about some of those at some other time, uh, Neil. Um, I think he was a decent human being. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, you can't deny the influence he has had on talk radio and on the right. Uh, he was, uh, like you said, the king of uh, talk radio and conservative movement. I mean, there's, I mean, there's just no denying that. I mean, we still use terms that he came up with, you know, like feminazi, you know, yeah, it's I like, know, I, know. I still throw that around. It's just genius. <laughs> uh, and how he'd play, uh, was it Shanklin was the music he would put on that, 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 that do the stare, the, uh, sat satirical music yeah. and whatnot he'd play. Uh, so he made it fun, uh, and, annoying to the to the left I don't, and anybody who annoys the left is a is, is a good guy in my book <laughs> yeah yeah and of course you know limbaugh had his controversies over the years now i will say this in his defense i think some of the controversies were made up by yeah, the left wing media they were trying to destroy him of course the left despised limbaugh because not only i think they despise him for what he stood for but how he did it did it with yeah comedy he did it in a lighthearted way oftentimes and he really made fools out of the far left yeah a lot of times i think that's what bothered them the most and they tried to take him down several times uh the the first thing that comes to my mind is the donovan McNabb controversy about 15 years ago about you know issues of black quarterbacks in the nfl and i'm not going to through that because you know, um, you know, I, I care less about the issue. But the point is, is that the left went after him very hard um, on a lot of different issues. I think I think in the end, Neil, I think when we look at Limbaugh's legacy, I think he came full circle. And um, while generally I have my problems with Limbaugh and his ideas of pulling your, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. Um, 
because I think there's a lot of nuances in life that oftentimes conservatives don't want to deal with, um, uh, particularly when people work hard throughout this life and still don't make it. Yet you have other people that can do it using vices in order to make it. And yet as conservatives, they really don't take that into account. Um, and, and, and again, public virtue versus public vice and, and public sin that oftentimes the political right doesn't condemn because we're trying to work our way through this indifferent society. That's where I have my differences with Limbaugh because it, it's a difficult world. It's a tough world. And if the idea is that Limbaugh preached off of that, you got to work hard. If you work hard in America, you can make it. Um, and listen, that's a good message. Um, I've always despised the fact that the Calvinists took the idea of the Protestant work ethic or the Calvinist work the ethic as they describe themselves that, you know, again, work leads you to God in some capacity. I guess from my perspective as a Catholic, I, I, I knew nobody who worked harder actually than Catholics who were generally speaking labor workers who did the best they could to raise their families, whether they were immigrating or working in their home countries. And I guess to make a long story short here, um, the idea of American exceptionalism and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm all in favor of that to a certain extent, but I always believe the political right failed to properly contextualize in this fallen world what we're to do with people that actually hit hard times and fall through the cracks. Because I, I sensed oftentimes from the political right that if you don't make money in America, if you don't figure out how to make money in America, I should say, that somehow you're an inferior citizen. And I got that sense oftentimes from the right-wing talk radio crowd. Yeah, it's as if you're lazy or you're not willing to make the the sacrifices. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, you know, well, sometimes the sacrifice is your family. Uh, and that's, yeah, that is a sacrifice I'm not willing to make. And it's not right that I should have to sacrifice my family in order to, you know, quote unquote, make it. Uh, yeah. And whatever that means. I mean, because everyone defines it differently is what make it means. Um, and, you know, when it comes to Russia, he did have that. Uh, he didn't have the the family to kind of hold him back in that sense, if you want to call it holding you back. Uh, and so he did have some advantages. I mean, that's like when Sean Hannity talks about how he made it, you know, and that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, but Sean, you, you were hobnobbing with some some uh, some well-to-do people, you know, it's it's not as if you just, well, I was laying sheetrock one day and then I recorded a podcast and <laughs> I, I, don't, I just exploded, you know, <laughs> you know, it's hey, like, listen, I've been, I've been recording podcasts for the past two decades. Nobody's ever discovered me, yeah. I'll tell you right now. Yeah. It's, so it's not like <laughs> as if, and I'm not saying they're lazy either, but it's not as if they were, you know, doing manual work that somehow. Right shot it off they happen to make certain um choices right or wrong uh sure. that led to where they're at and it's not as simple as just well you just need to pull yourself up uh all the time but that's the conservative mindset uh and rush was a proponent of the conservative philosophy uh 100 yeah. percent and i mean i that's, that's I think it's a little bit of what kind of turned me off a little bit um, is the devotion to the conservative ideology to a fault, you know, as if that is my faith. And it ran into conflict with the fact that, well, my faith is Catholicism, even though there's a lot of good in the conservative side, there's, there's good ideas. Yes. But when it becomes a religion in and of itself, that's where we have the rub. Um, and, and I guess I'm choosing my, I'm trying to choose my words carefully because I don't want a dog rush. Yeah, I know. Uh, Me too. You know, I, mean, I don't like talking bad about a man who's gone now. Um, but there are things that we disagreed on and so, some big issues, uh, even though he did a lot of good in his life. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's, it's difficult um, in that sense. And, um, I don't appreciate on the left right now, they're really partying it up over there and, yeah, and they're showing really the callousness that is a left-wing movement. I know for myself, I'll tell you right now, Neil, and this is just me and, and maybe I'm wrong here because some Catholics I think will say this. You know, the other day I heard um, the passing of uh, Larry Flint happened two days ago, I believe is where it was. And um, 
him and Hugh Hefner really defined um, what I consider, you know, the one of the most diabolical elements to ever hit our civilization. That is pushing the the issue of pornography. And I think those two men, along with a bunch of others in there, don't get me wrong, um, have done such substantial damage to the hearts and minds of so many young men. They leave this world and go before the judgment of God, leaving billions of young men addicted to pornography. And I can't think of two men that have actually ever done more damage. You can argue the abortion industry, absolutely. But yeah. in regards to sort of the social dysfunction, these are two of the most diabolical men that use, once again, the concept of liberty to redefine against, you know, pornography as free speech. And yet they're gone from this world. And they're two men that I never really cared for, never really liked. But even with that, with my displeasure with, with Hefner and with um, the other gentleman there, Larry Flint, when I heard of their deaths, I said a prayer for them, Neil. I did. And um, I don't relish in the death of my enemies. I don't relish in the death of anybody, really. But even those that I am not on terms with, and even those that I believe have been detrimental to the world and have done so much damage and in many ways destroyed so many lives, even upon death, they get my blessing. And in the sense that I leave it in God's hands, not that mm -hmm. I'm acquitting them of anything. That's for God's judgment there. Yeah, it's but for mercy. Say, exactly. But I will say a prayer that God's righteous judgment would be upon them. If my prayer can help them in the afterlife, despite what they've done, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to piss on their gravestone like the left is doing right now with rush. That is an absolute disgrace, but a satanic left. Well, yes, yeah, because they have no belief or understanding of sin or hell. And uh, they think, well, it's it's nothing. I guess you go into nothingness or something. But because they don't have a concept of sin and judgment and damnation, then they have no fear of it. And so, so they don't have any compassion or mercy for the person who may uh, be receiving some kind of judgment now at this point. Um, I mean, even if, you know, I'm not saying Russia is going to hell, uh, but we all receive a judgment for our actions uh, that we've chosen in this life. And so we pray for those who have passed by, passed on, in the hope that they, they've at least made it to purgatory uh, and that they can be purged of, their, of the sins that they've chosen. Uh, and we hold on to that hope no matter how bad that person was. Uh, I mean, because we can't know exactly what has happened to their soul. And so it's that at least a hope that uh, they may have repented at the end and that our prayers can help them uh, through purgatory, at least. Yeah, yeah. And I think, too, I think I remember listening to Rush about a week or two ago, maybe two weeks ago, I think he went off the air at some point, early January, early to mid-January, right around there. And he was talking about his situation, how it was terminal, his time was coming. Certain medications that he was taking um, had extended his life beyond what was mm -hmm. predicted, of course, of him to live. He, they say he was supposed to pass on in October, but these experimental drugs pushed him out apparently now to, till today, February. And one of the things he said was, is interesting, um, and you know, we've all heard this before, though, as his kind of his mortality was, was waning and he knew he was going to go, he talked about really openly about his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And listen, you could tell it, it, it's, it's a Protestant concept. We've all heard it before. Yeah. We Catholics, we dealt with it with friends. And, and so he had his, I guess, at least publicly stated his alter call from a Protestant perspective. And, and what I would say is, you know, as a Catholic, we would say that's a partial truth. It's a partial truth. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what I'm hoping for Rush is that maybe, maybe, and, and I don't know how God's judgment works in the end, only God knows, but maybe I'm hoping he had that true act of contrition on his deathbed and, and maybe the Lord would recognize that need. Yeah. I mean, that's like I said, it's one of the, we hold out hope that they 
repented in some way. Yeah. And as a result, at the very least, uh, make it to purgatory to to get that f- uh, final purgation of their uh, sins and choices they made on earth. Well, uh, Neil, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I know you went to seminary, okay? Um, can a Protestant who makes a perfect contrition on his deathbed without the sacramental of reconciliation without the sacrament of reconciliation mm-hmm. can a protestant be saved without the sacrament well the normal uh means of salvation is through the sacraments right but you also have the extraordinary um and that would be up to ignorance you know their invincible ignorance on their part mm-hmm. uh which would affect how culpable they are for their sins and if there is a desire um, for baptism, for confession, you know, for the truth, basically. So just like we have a baptism of desire, um, you could have a a kind of reconciliation by desire. Um, but there's no way of me knowing that. Um, that's why we say we have hope. Yeah. Um, because this is not the normal way in which someone finds salvation. Because there's no salvation outside the church, um, which simply means if they are saved, it'll be because of the church. So the question would really come down to just how ignorant was this person. Um, and like I said, you can't really know. I mean, without unless you're doing some kind of full investigation of the person's yeah. life. Sure. Uh, but you can't really know. So we oh, we can't hold to hope. Uh, that th- through some means um, they find salvation, but it doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, know. I don't want to give people a false idea that well, it's not you know it's easy to be saved without the church. And no, you cannot be saved without the church. That's just the thing. If they do receive salvation, it'll it is be through the church, um, and through their invincible ignorance. Mm-hmm. Um, but I come back to the fact that I said invincible ignorance. We're not talking about a willful ignorance. We're talking about someone who's truly ignorant of the truth. Um, but I don't, I don't want to hazard a guess as to how ignorant Rush is or anything. Sure, of course. Because no, like I said, I can't yeah. know. Um, that's why we still pray for him regardless. And we'll find out when we get to heaven, if yeah. we get to heaven. <laughs> well, I know um, Our Lady of Good Success in Quito, Ecuador, in, in her apparitions of the 17th century, of many of the things that will come in our time, 20th and 21st century, she did talk about how many would die without the sacrament of extreme unction. Yeah, yeah which uh, is last rites. To, which is last rites. Yeah, and so Our Lady emphasized the importance of um, last rites, and I know I've talked to a few friends over the years, it's, it's been difficult because when they've had loved ones that are close to death, I brought up the importance of not just extreme unction, but final confession and communion yeah. if that's possible. And a lot of these friends, you know, they, br- they bring it up to the loved ones and the loved ones just just reject it. No, I, yeah. don't, I don't trust the church and I hate the church and all this stuff. And it's like... It's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah that's when in, that, in those kind of situations when you ask, "Gee, can it be saved without the church?" Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want to say. It's like you kind of don't want to say it in the sense, but no, yeah. <laughs> you can't be saved at that point because that's an outright rejection sure. of the church. That's not. That's just not a a whoops. Uh, I didn't know or th- no, you know, and you just you don't want anything to do with it anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you're rejecting Christ mm-hmm. because that is his mystical body. At that point. So, yeah, you, you can't find salvation like that. Um, well, yeah, I think it's, it's I think <laughs> Protestants would say, well, what about the thief on the cross? He didn't have time for any sacramentals. He was just up there and he, he confessed believed to Jesus. that he was saved and Jesus proclaimed it. <laughs> well, he confessed directly to Jesus standing <laughs> next to him. Fair enough. <laughs> well, crucified yeah. next to him. <laughs> yeah, this is true. You know what? <laughs> As simple as that is, I never even thought of it that way. <laughs> I mean, right. 
he he confessed it right there that I don't deserve to be saved. Yeah. Well, that, he, he's confessing his sin at that point. Yeah. And he's saying, "Remember me when you enter into paradise, when you go into your kingdom." So there's a desire right there. Yeah. He he's saying I'm a sinner, and he has the desire to be with Christ. Yeah. And yeah. then we have Christ Himself tell him, "Yeah, you're going to be with me in paradise." Do you think there's a priority to the sacraments when we're faced in our deathbed? I mean, is there one that's more important than the other? Is it communion? Is it confession? Is it extreme? Depends on the state of your soul. What's that? It depends on the state of your soul. Uh, Right. If you're in mortal sin, then confession is the priority. Of course. Um, If you're able to confess, if you can't, if you physically can't, uh, then extra unction will, it will, provide the grace that you need because once again there's the desire but i just right. can't so right. just receiving last rites would uh would be good enough i'd say good enough but is is what's gonna forgive your sins and reception of the holy eucharist because the holy eucharist is is uh aimed towards forgiveness of sin as well um but the thing is it's mortal sin that's forgiven through confession it's yes. the only way you can that's the only way you can receive absolution um so it depends on the state of your soul in that situation um now i've never heard of last rites being given without the option of confession like every time last rites has been given he's the priest is saying do you want to go to confession first yeah so usually he's there to hear a confession and give you uh, okay confession. so so let me just ask a question here. If the person is incapable, let's say they're in a state of a coma of some kind, yeah. and they're incapable of receiving communion and, and confessing their sins, receiving the, the sacrament of reconciliation, mm-hmm. then extreme unction is enough to save that person possibly? Yes. Because okay. because it's not a it's not as though they're not confessing because they're choosing to. They're they're not confessing, not receiving because they're physically unable to, right. through no fault of their own. Right. Um, and I think. So, but what people would say is, well, how do you know if that person desires to truly repent and to truly receive communion if he's, you know, if he was capable of it? Well, Christ knows that. Once he knows again, your heart, right? Yeah. yeah, but we would still pray for that person's soul. Sure. Um, and so we do the best we can, you know. The priest does the best he can to te- to uh, offer the sacraments. Ultimately, Christ knows that person's intent, and that will determine where he's going to end up at that point. Mm-hmm. Because if they're, it's like when you go. I mean, you go to confession now, and if you're going to confession, knowing you're going to commit that same sin again, you, you're intending to do so, then you don't get your sins forgiven, and you get another sin of a sacrilege. So yeah. even if the priest gives you absolution, you're not getting absolution at that point because you're lying sure. to Christ in your heart and mind. Um, so it would be it's similar to that in that Christ knows what you're up to and whether or not it is effective is going to have to do with your intent. Okay. Um, and so we okay. do the best we can and then you end up where you end up at that point. Okay, okay. And my final question for tonight um, and Neil, for you concerning Limbaugh again, um, is it okay for a Catholic to pray for a soul even though he was not a Catholic? Oh, of course, because okay. we, because ultimately, after everything is said and done, we don't know, right, where he ended up, and that man could be in purgatory and no one's praying for him, yeah. and which means he's stuck there, you know, or at least for a longer period of time. Sure. Uh, so the charitable thing to do is to offer prayers for his soul so that hopefully, uh, he can, he's in purgatory and hopefully gets out and sees a beat of the vision. Right now I'm saying the words, hopefully we don't know. Uh, and that's one of the, that's the dangers of not, of not being Catholic or just rejecting the church is you don't know. Okay. Cause you don't have the promise of the sacraments. You don't have the promise of the Eucharist and confession so there's a there's a chance that and, and and I know some people would say, well, he'd done a lot of good things, done a lot of good things. Okay, but that that is what the Protestants would call a work based salvation. 
Okay. That, well, I've done good things. That's all that matters. See, that's yeah. the other, that's the other extreme. Well, of the faith I, alone. Yeah. But I think what Protestants would generally say is that that person had an act of faith and accepted Jesus Christ, personal Lord and savior. Therefore God understands the heart well, yeah, for see, these rituals like sacraments. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's what I'm, I'm I'm kind of pointing out is that you have this, these, some people have this idea that, well, I've done good works and that's all that matters. And you have the other people say, well, I've made an act of faith and that's all that matters. Yeah. Um, They're so there's two wrong. extremes we can fall yeah. through, fall into. Yeah. Um, it's not what he did. That's going to save him. It, it is his faith. Now that doesn't mean he doesn't have any works to go with his faith. Of course he, yeah. he needs that. But, but that's what, that's what I said. We hold on to hope. We have to keep hoping and offer those prayers for his soul. Okay. Because that's what charity demands. Okay. All right. Fair enough. And speaking of mortal sin, I got 20 minutes here before mass Lenten mass starts <laughs> for me here. So I got to run, uh, Neil buddy. I want to thank you for joining me tonight. And, uh, Neil's back. We're going to be doing a lot more podcasts together. And uh, we got some more big guests coming up here on the Knights of Krishna. Hey, buddy, thanks for joining me tonight. My pleasure. All right. This is Frank. I want to thank Neil again. Signing off for the Knights of Krishna. Good night, everybody. <laughs>